This is Niels. Niels is heading to the Open Info Summit in Berlin. Niels loves everything about traveling, like making acquaintance with the friendly locals. I love it. Enjoying the local cuisine. I love it. Or capturing the sights and attractions. I love it. Using the amenities. I love it. Getting around like a Berliner. I love it. Discovering local fashion trends. I love it. Niels is joining his friends and colleagues at the Open Infra Summit 2022. I love it. Welcome to the Open Infra Summit. You'll love it too. Please welcome Allison Price and Jonathan Bryce. Uh, I'm Jonathan Bryce. And I'm Allison Price from the Open Infra Foundation. And uh, as, you, as you probably already knew, but if you're jet lagged, maybe you didn't realize it until Niels told you, we are in Berlin. <laughs> uh, back in person, having our Open Infra Summit. And thank you to Niels, he's somewhere here. Um, you should uh, give him a high five for helping us make that video to get everybody pumped about being in Berlin. Um, and you know, I'm just so excited to have uh, to have in-person events again. Obviously, you know, the last couple of years have been very different from the previous few years for us. We, uh, we are now back in person after two and a half years of endless Jitsi calls and Zooms and you know, virtual events and virtual PTGs. And we continue to get a lot of stuff done as a community. All of our development teams were, um, were continuing to work, crank out code, make a lot of progress, uh, but we also had a lot of interesting milestones that happened um, since we were last in person in Shanghai in 2019. Uh, as most of you may know, we have a new name. We launched a new foundation, the Open Infrastructure Foundation, at, at the beginning of last year. So that's a, um, you know, a very exciting development that happened. And when we launched the foundation, we had the support of a lot of different organizations who we wouldn't be here without. So a lot of these organizations are here this week. So if you can, meet with them, learn from them. And if you're actually interested in becoming one of these organizations, please reach out to us at openinfo.dev slash join. We'd love to have you in the community. But even since we launched, just in one year of operation, we've actually had an increase of 33% of new organizations who are supporting our mission of building open source communities who write software that runs in production. So please welcome these new organizations who are now part of the Open Infra community. And, and we're going to be hearing about some more new organizations a little later today. It's a teaser for Mark. <laughs> so uh, in that time, we also celebrated uh, the 10-year anniversary of OpenStack, um, which is, uh, is really cool as a milestone um, you know, to see an open source community that's been so productive for so long. Uh, we also, uh, in our user survey, accounted for over 25 million cores of compute that are running in OpenStack environments. Many of those are in your organizations. Uh, so that's also another exciting uh, milestone. Some of our other projects, um, Zool, the CI CD system, is about to celebrate 10 years. Um, we're actually having a little celebration this week. Kata Containers is almost five years old. So, uh, so much work that has gone into um, these software projects over the years that just continue to, uh, to, to add up and, and move forward during, uh, during the last couple of years while we weren't getting together in person and celebrating it. 
And while we weren't getting together in person, we did want to continue the collaboration that makes these summits so special. So last year, we actually launched Open In For Live, which is a virtual show that airs every Thursday or every other Thursday. Um, but it is something that we want to be driven by the community. So if you have a story to tell, a use case to share, or even just some ideas that you want to banter with people on, we'd love to have you join us on Open In For Live. We're looking for people to cast different shows and bring some of these conversations to life throughout the rest of the year when we're not at a summit. So please reach out if you're interested. Um, it's been a successful show over the last couple of years. We also had, I think, four PTGs over the last two years. Um, so our upstream com community continued to collaborate, and every single one of our projects had a milestone release over the last two years, which is really incredible to see that the work that gets done at these in-person events was able to continue despite some of the challenges that we've been having over the last couple of years. So thank you for everyone who's been contributing. When we haven't been able to get back in person, um, we couldn't do it all without you. So here we are, back in person, finally. Um, it's, it's uh, I think, going to be a great week. We have a lot of wonderful sessions. We're going to talk about a few of those in a minute. Uh, but before that, I also did want to acknowledge that um, you know, we are still in, uh, in kind of a, a, a pandemic phase that is impacting our community as well as the rest of the world. And we do have uh, some very active community members who aren't able to join us still. And we want to uh, we give them a shout out. Uh, we're going to be um, uh, sharing all of this content from this week online with, uh, with those community members. Yeah, we specifically wanted to reach out to our community in China, which is a significant um, part of the Open Infra community who wasn't able to come based on travel restrictions. So we will be posting this on WeChat and Tencent Cloud throughout the week just so they are able to collaborate and see what's going on here in person as well. And the pandemic isn't the only world event that's affecting our community. We have hundreds of contributors and community members from Ukraine who are affected by the war there. And uh, to show our support, we are doing a fundraiser um, through World Central Kitchen, which works with local restaurants to feed uh, people who are going through disruption in their lives and um, help them avoid food insecurity. Uh, so you can follow this link to, uh, to contribute and donate. Um, this is uh, also a program that we are going to match the donations from the foundation. So uh, I, I love this. I see some of you scanning this QR code. <laughs> Uh, please um, uh, join this fundraiser with us and, uh, and you know, help share a little support back to, uh, to the community in Ukraine. If we look forward, we, uh, we do have some more in-person events on the book as we start to kind of ease back into this as a, as a foundation as an, and as a community. Um, this coming October, we will have our first in-person PTG in, uh, in a few years in Columbus. That's going to be October 17th to 20th. You can go to openinfra.dev slash PTG to find out more. And then in, uh, in just about a year from now, the Open Infra Summit will return to Vancouver, which has been, I think, one of our favorite cities. We've had a couple of great summits there, and I'm very excited to go back and, and enjoy everything that, uh, that Vancouver has to offer. But here this week, we're here in Berlin. And like Jonathan said, it's been two and a half years since we've all been here in person. And so we hope everyone has a really great week. We're going to plug a lot of different content this morning that you can see throughout the week. But we really encourage you to just meet the people next to you this week and learn from each other and have a great summit. And then for more logistics, um, so within your badge, you do have a QR code that has a lot of really helpful information, um, including the Wi-Fi, which I assume most of you are already on. Um, as well as the venue map and some other helpful resources to help navigate the summit throughout the week. Today and tomorrow in the afternoon, we will have a midday mixer. So use this opportunity to visit our different sponsors on level B, so downstairs one level. Um, and the beer garden will be open at that time, just um, in case you saw that walking in. Um, and this will also be the time where you can pick up your summit t-shirt. So, I think this is something we've all kind of missed over the last year. There's a um, ticket in your badge to make sure you get that, and there will also be stickers, I hear. So that's yeah. always a fan favorite. And we have a couple of other areas. Uh, uh, Allison mentioned the Marantis Beer Garden, which is outside. Um, that's uh, that's going to be here all week. There's uh, the Open Telecom Lounge, uh, sponsored by T-Systems. Um, the Starling X Lounge, sponsored by Wind River. So uh, please, you know, mingle, talk to the sponsors, talk to the, your fellow attendees, and really um, kind of just take this opportunity that we have to be back together and, 
and spend that, uh, that awesome networking time. And finally, one, uh, one other thing that we want to mention is the Community Metrics Lounge. Uh, we have partnered with Viturgia as our official um, foundation metrics partner. And they have uh, a Community Metrics Corner where they are talking about open source project sustainability and how to kind of measure um, the activity and, and success and sustainability of open source. So go check them out as well. And another opportunity you have this week to learn from each other is lots of different sessions. We have over 100 breakout sessions and forum discussions, hands-on workshops. So please visit those on level B and level A throughout the rest of the week. And you can find the schedule online at openinfra.dev slash summit schedule. And finally, um, please remember to wear your mask. I'm looking around, and I appreciate seeing uh, that you're all uh, thinking of each other and, and taking this step. We have a lot of people who are here from all over the place. They have different health requirements, different travel requirements. We want to look out for each other. Um, so please wear your mask when you're indoors. Uh, you know, if, if you need a mask break, which we often all do as we go through a full day, um, the Marantis Beer Garden is outdoors. It's a good spot to go get some fresh air and take one of those breaks. So again, welcome. Very uh, excited to be here with you all. Uh, we have a, a great set of content this morning and the rest of the day and, and Wednesday and Thursday as well. And we're going to go ahead and get that kicked off right now with the COO of the Open Infra Foundation, Mark Collier. Good morning, everyone. It is good to be back. You know, hearing Jonathan talk about that beer garden, I just kept thinking, things go sideways in my keynote, I'll just make a beeline for the beer garden. So thank you, Marantis, for giving me an out. You know, I wanted to talk today, of course, about the cloud and where things are going, and I thought it would be fun to sort of kick things off by consulting the Wayback Machine, finding some old quote or two about the cloud, see how they hold up. You know, people have been talking about the cloud for a while, right? It's going to take over the world. Well, this person who was, I guess, the CEO of Amazon at the time made this bold statement that 95% of the world's IT spend is, is actually on premises and not in the cloud. Thankfully, he said premises instead of premise, so credit for that. Uh, so does anyone want to guess when this quote was said? Any guesses? 2006? Okay. Good guess. Um, it was actually in April of 2022. <laughs> so I didn't really use the Wayback Machine. That was a setup. Um, but this is really interesting because this is Andy Jassy. He's saying this on CNBC. So why would the CEO of Amazon be saying this on CNBC? Well, I think what he's clearly saying, without saying it, is that the cloud can get 20 times bigger from here. And I think he's absolutely right. I think the cloud market absolutely can get that much bigger. And it, it, I know that a lot of us have been working in cloud, it seems like, forever, and everyone's like, what's the next thing? And the reality is, if you just look at the internet, right, the early days of the internet till the web came out, till the iPhone came out, it's, it's decades, right? And I think we're in a similar time frame. We should not expect things to happen overnight. But it just gives you an idea, a little bit of perspective, kind of helps me map out in my mind what's going on, what have we been working on, what do we need to work on next. So to put that in perspective, the total global IT spend is $3.6 trillion, and the 5% gives you $180 billion. So this is not a small market, good news. You're all working on a, a big business, but it certainly can get a lot bigger. And I think if you look at who are the players today, no surprise, you know, Amazon is at the top based on this market share data. So about a third of that 5% is what currently is represented when you look at it from, from that perspective. And then, you know, you might wonder who's the number two player, right? So does anyone have a guess as, as, as who's the number two market share? I heard Microsoft. Azure, I think that counts as Microsoft. Um, maybe Google, Alibaba. So it's actually um, other. So you're all wrong, yeah. Um, so what, what is this other? I mean, all we hear about all day long is, is, is a, a two or three companies, right? But I think that 
we know who powers this other, and it's many, many providers, a lot of whom are here today, you know, the Vexos of the world, he's going to be speaking this week, OVH, T-Systems, Clura, NEPA, there's many, many different um, OpenStack powered public clouds, and that provides a massive footprint, number two in market share, but actually number one if you look at it in terms of number of data centers. So this is, this is 180 plus data centers, more data centers than, than any cloud provider if you look at it in aggregate. So really, I think the point I want to draw from this is that, yes, it's early in the cloud. We've already seen a lot of different people working together to achieve a pretty phenomenal footprint here. And how have they done that? In a word, it's, it's collaboration, which may be a word you're tired of by now. I think it's kind of been used, overused, has it lost its meaning? But we certainly know that that is what this event is about and what this community is about. And so to be more specific, what we're really talking about is collaborating, collaboration, meaning many different organizations writing the same piece of software, committing to the same code repo, reviewing each other's patches, right? So that is not how all software is written, but that's certainly the experience that we've, we've many of you have been, been a part of, and that's the, the success of that model, I think, is resulted in, although it's early days for cloud, in the $180 billion, we still see you know, quite a bit of it in the, the other, and uh, I'm proud to be one of the others, so hope you are too. But if you look at the way software is built, they're, of course, proprietary software. People are still giving that a go. Single vendor open source definitely seems to, to rise and fall with the times, um, but absolutely companies are still doing that, and, and that's definitely one way to go, but I think that the model that we feel is not only the best model but necessary in order to get to a market that's 20 times bigger is the open development model. So again, this is collaboration specifically, many, many companies contributing to write software together. And the OSI, Stefano Mafuli is the executive director over there. They're a great organization, nonprofit, the keeper of the, the open source definition, and they certainly have, have pr played an important role and continue to in helping educate and evangelize what we mean by open source. And if you actually think about some of those single company open source vendors, some of them have kind of backpedaled a little bit, changed licenses till the point where they're not even really open source. So, that's definitely not a model that is, is at a dead end, but I think for the type of infrastructure scale we're talking about, the kind of problems that we need to solve to get to a 20x bigger market, those problems we really do have to work together and write the software together. I certainly believe that. And this is based on some experience. Um, we have seen that open collaboration works. If you look at OpenStack, for example, over 450 different companies, organizations, have employed over 8,700 developers who've contributed to OpenStack. So that's massive scale. There's only two or three other projects that have that kind of um, breadth, but they're also really successful. The Linux, OpenStack, Kubernetes, those are very popular combinations for infrastructure today. And so we think that for these types of scale of problems, this is the model that works. And another way to look at the, the, the numbers is that we have 25 million cores of compute around the world that are managed by OpenStack. And together, it's a $7.7 .7 billion a year market in terms of revenue for that ecosystem. And so if we kind of look forward and think about where the trends get a sense for uh, mapping out what's happening between now and the, the 20x uh, world we're heading to over the next several years. You know, first of all, data is exploding. In three years from now, we're going to need to store 181 zettabytes, which is about twice as much as we currently store today. And it's only going to go up from there. So these types of, of problems demand collaboration across companies to write new software, right? We're going to need to connect 50 billion devices by 2030. And there are many other use cases, everything from mobile telemedicine. We have regions of the world that simply don't have access to doctors of any kind, certainly not specialists. 
And there's a real opportunity with increased connectivity and other forms of open source can play a big role here in, in enabling this infrastructure. We can actually help people in regions that don't have access today to just basic care. We know self-driving cars, we're gonna hear a keynote about that in a little bit, are already coming to market, being tested using things like Zool and other open source software. And humanity is not content, I think, to even stay on this planet. And we're looking to go back to the moon and ultimately to Mars and out of the solar system. So there's big aspirations for humanity and it's gonna require a lot more software to get written. And last but not least, all this software, all this data, all these mobile connections is going to continue to provide challenges when it comes to security. And we've got some great com conversations happening just in a few minutes about confidential computing as an example, which is the Kata Containers community is really leading the, the charge on, which is part, part of the Open Infra uh, Foundation projects. And, you know, I can't think of another example of a type of a problem that just absolutely cannot be solved by one company alone. It's just not, it doesn't make any sense, right? So we already see lots of companies working together. So all of these problems on the way to this, you know, $3.6 trillion market, 20x growth, there's just no way they can be solved by one company alone. So what we really need to do this is a powerful network of companies, organizations around the world. And that is exactly why we launched the Open Infra Foundation a year ago, as Jonathan and, and Allison mentioned just a minute ago. And that foundation, the Open Infra Foundation, is that powerful network of organizations who are writing software together. Already writing it today, but we're also thinking about what other software needs to get written. And I think that's going to be a big theme of this week, a lot of the conversations in the hallway and then uh, the keynotes and, and, and the breakout sessions and maybe even in the Marantis beer tent. So new, new projects will, will get spun up and the foundation is here to help with that. We also, when we created this new foundation a year ago, did it with the support of a number of platinum members, a lot of whom are new, like uh, you know, Ant Group, Fiber Home, Meta, some people still call it Facebook, but they prefer Meta. Um, Microsoft, I think I see uh, some Microsoft folks in, in the audience, and, and Wind River in addition to, to many other companies. And that's because of this importance of creating this powerful network to write that software. And today, for the first time, we're announcing two new gold members, Bloomberg Engineering, who's going to be speaking in just a few minutes, and Vexo. So those are our newest gold members. So overall, since we started the foundation just a year ago to kind of create this network, it has actually grown by 33%. So we just continue to see more uh, companies join. You have companies like Acme Gating, who's a big supporter of the Zool project, Fungible, you'll be hearing more about that's doing some interesting stuff in the DPU world. And so when you put it all together, it creates this powerful network of members. And again, the purpose of why we're here and what we need to do to support this evolution of the cloud market is to write software together. And so, in kind of taking a step back and looking at the market and where it's going, some of the trends, it, it's helped me to create kind of a map of what the opportunity is. Three trillion dollars, all these companies investing to build these tools, everybody working together. But at the same time, just being back here with all of you, it's really reminded me, after two and a half years, that, you know, the map is not the territory and Logos don't write, write code, right? It's people, it's individuals, it's humans, it's all of you. And when I put up stats like 180 zettabytes, probably some of you are thinking, oh, how are we going to do that with existing solutions? You know, how are we going to scale out? Do I need to create something new? Do we need to re-architect? So if that's where your mind goes when you see that kind of growth, first of all, you're in the right place. And second of all, you're not alone. So seek out those other storage geeks, and you know, I'm not just trying to pick on storage, I just like to say Zettabyte, but um, the reality is this is the place to do that kind of work. And when we think about the purpose of the summit, why we're in Berlin, wh what we can accomplish this week, I think it's really about each of you connecting with each other. You know, when you hear we need to connect uh, 50 billion devices by, by 2030, 
You might be thinking, well, what about latency? Do we need 6G, you know? How are we ever gonna pull this off? Do we need to put compute at the edge? Where's the storage gonna go? Again, if, if that's kind of where your mind goes, you're in the right place and you're not alone, so find, find each other and, and work that out. And if you're Tim Bell from CERN, you're probably thinking like, what about the speed of light, you know? So everybody has got something they're trying to uh, break the barriers on, but that's what we're here for. And there are amazing sessions throughout this week, we're gonna be hearing about the Kata containers, confidential computing use case. In just a few minutes, I believe they have a demo. So let's hope the demo gods smile on them. There's a, another session about the future of AI, which is gonna have a big role in this uh, 20 times bigger cloud market. And another example was elastic secure infrastructure we'll be hearing about tomorrow. So many different great people you can meet here and talk about these stories, think about what software needs to get created, whether it needs to land in existing projects or if we need to create a new project. And in terms of creating new projects at the Open Infra Foundation, if that's the right way to solve the problem, we got you, don't worry. We have a new model for hosting open source infrastructure projects. And Terry Carez, our general manager, will be doing a deep dive on this tomorrow. See him here, so you can always, you know, hit him up just like any time and ask for it. Ask for the keynote early. Um, so he's gonna do a deep dive on this, but there's details on the website right now. And I just really believe that it's all about each of us as a community working together. So let's build the next decade of open infrastructure. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mark. He mentioned uh, new gold members, Vextoast and Bloomberg, and we now have an opportunity to actually uh, hear directly from Bloomberg. Yes, so please join us in welcoming the Manager of Computer Engineering from Bloomberg, Dimitri Margolin. Thank you for the warm welcome, and good morning, Open Infra Summit. I'm Dimitri Margolin, I'm manager of computer engineering, and I'm thrilled to be here today to, uh, to <laughs> with you in person in Berlin to mark us joining the, the Open Infra Foundation as a gold member. Over the last two decades, we've been on a journey to become an open source first company. Um, we believe that, it's, that open source drives innovation, and it's not just within our business of providing information to the most influential business and financial decision makers, but also in the, across the global tech industry. To, there's a quote from Alyssa from our open source program office. And as an open source first company, Bloomberg is committed to supporting the health and growth of open source. To this end, we encourage and make it easy for engineers to learn, contribute, and lead in open source. Today, we're using hundreds, if not thousands, of open source projects across our tech stack. And you could find Bloomberg engineers serving as contributors, committers, core developers, and um, even steering committee members across the OpenStack ecosystem. If you navigate to github.com slash Bloomberg, you could find projects that were started at Bloomberg, open source projects that were started at Bloomberg. And now that we are a proud member of the Open Infra Foundation, you can anticipate even more involvement from Bloomberg in this vibrant community that we've been a part of, uh, no, that we've, um, um, sorry. Bloomberg in support of, uh, we supported OpenStack since 2013, about a decade ago. So as you can see, OpenStack actually powers a lot of workloads. Some of those workloads include in production like uh, mobile and web development, machine learning, um, databases, and more. And our own Chris Morgan has been deeply involved with the OpenStack Open Operators Group, and we've even hosted a few mid-cycle mid meetups in the Bloomberg offices around the globe. So how do we use OpenStack? Uh, today, it powers um, one of the key production applications that we have on OpenStack is BCC, or Bloomberg Cloud Compute. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that today. Um, it's our company's private virtual computing and storage platform. 
Um, it's specifically designed for high performance and flexible capacity scaling. It is the largest compute platform in our data centers around the globe today. And it's, it's a foundation for some of the internal applications. Some of those include BPAS, or Bloomberg Platform as a Service, um, a container deployment system on top of Kubernetes, and our organization's fully managed x86 environment. Thanks to OpenStack, our BCC platform alleviates many time-consuming tasks. Okay. <laughs> Not sure what that was. Um, eliminate, eliminates a lot of time consuming tasks by providing tools to build, configure, and maintain the computing and storage resources the application needs. Uh, so, what does BCC architecture look like? Well, we're running 10 OpenStack production clusters across our data centers in the world. Uh, the, avail the availability of BCC has actually accelerated the move from physical machines to virtual machines in our data centers to keep up with the demand. Our core network is pure layer three IP fabric with distributed firewalls. And um, with BGP all the way down to the hypervisors. This network has actually, has been practically, comes with practically unlimited scalability. Today we're running about 150,000 cores, physical cores, four petabytes of memory, on top of 80 petabytes of Ceph storage, hosting 35,000 virtual machines. And, and it's clear that OpenStack is an important component of our software infrastructure at Bloomberg. And we're deeply invested in long-term success and growth of this open source project. If you want to hear more, stop by our booth in the sponsor hall or attend a talk by one of our cloud infrastructure engineers, Tyler Stachecki, titled Honey, I Blew Up the Cloud, on Thursday at 9.40 in B09. Uh, we are hiring. This is just a glimpse of some of the positions we have available in the open source or open stack. But for the complete list, you can go to Bloomberg, bloomberg.com slash careers. I look forward to meeting and chatting with many of you over the next couple of days. And I think back to Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. I'm still working on the, the fist bump thing. When we went back there, Allison was like, I don't think I've connected on a single fist bump yet. Uh, so awesome to have Bloomberg joining the foundation and increasing their support and their uh, activity in the community and open source overall. I love to see that. Um, another one of the projects that, uh, that we host at the Open Infra Foundation is Kata Containers. And uh, this is um, it's actually the first project that we started hosting as we expanded beyond OpenStack. Very cool project, and we have a few segments here that are going to kind of give us some updates on Kata Containers. Um, one of the things that I love about Kata Containers is it's a great example of that, uh, that kind of ecosystem development that Mark was talking about. It started with a small dedicated team of engineers from a few companies. This was the, the Kata launch party in my house in Austin, Texas. We had uh, Tex-Mex um, Chewies in Austin, if you go there. Yeah, get the boom boom sauce. <laughs> um, and it, it grew from just uh, a few companies to dozens of companies that are contributing to it, using it, and deploying it for all kinds of large-scale applications um, all over the world. We mentioned earlier that some of our uh, our, our most active community members are not able to travel right now with, uh, with certain restrictions. Um, and one of those is one of the project leaders for Kata Containers um, that, uh, that works at Ant Group. Ant Group is a, a very large uh, financial technology company. They secure billions of transactions. Uh, it's uh, basically the largest payment processor in the world, and they run Kata Containers. And there's um, a brand new white paper that they have, uh, have put together and that we've just released uh, that is covering um, the best practices that they have for running containers securely and at scale from, uh, from Ant Group. Now, uh, Xu Wang could not be here, but he and Horace Lee put together uh, a little video update um, to share with us. So we're going to go ahead and watch that now and hear from Xu and Horace.
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Horace Lee and I am the Open Infra Foundation Community Manager in China. And I want to say hello to everyone on behalf of the Open Infra community in China. I hope we're able to get back together with everyone very soon in person. Today, um, I would like to introduce Xu Wang, an engineer at N Group. Um, who is Open Infra Foundation Platinum member and a long time contributor and user of Kata containers. Why you think other companies should adopt Kata containers? In, the, in, in this year, 2022, and uh, we, have, uh, we have made the Kata containers uh, much, much easier to use. It's easy to integrate with your uh, Kubernetes and other cloud native infrastructures. Uh, it's it's all used the stand, standard interface, and uh, you don't need to change change any other code. Just some configurations and use the runtime class and and and, and something else. You can just uh, use the Kata containers out of box. With Kata containers, you can you can get better isolation uh, for the for the security for the also privacy, but also for the performance isolation for the failure isolation. Makes the SRE slide easier. In this year, we can we have reduced the, the memory consumptions and the per, performance penalty very 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 low. So you can you can get the much back from the uh, the heterogeneous workload brings your uh, the high efficiency and, and others. The Kata containers is uh, yeah is, is fully functioned and uh, and right now we have some companies like like the Ant Group and others they have adopted the Kata containers. So um, I think that's. Uh, it's a good time for, for other companies to consider about the Kata containers. Thank you, Xu. I hope we can see each other in person very soon. I miss those guys. <laughs> um, so great to hear that that update from uh, from Horace and Xu. Uh, I mentioned the the white paper from Ant Group that they uh, that they recently published. There's also a brand new case study from SciSec that is on the Kata Containers uh, website as well. And it's, uh, it's, it's really cool to see how Kata has developed as an ecosystem and also just these use cases that are coming out. The, um, the subsequent versions of it, the performance has, has um, increased dramatically. So great work being done there. Um, and to actually show us a little more of that, we do have some of the uh, Kata Containers leaders here from the Architecture Committee. Um, so I want to go ahead and welcome on the stage Eric, Fabiano, and Samuel. All right. Hey, y'all. I'm Eric. I'm here with uh, my colleagues Fabiano and Samuel to talk to you about Kata Containers and really to talk about a new use case the community's been working on around confidential computing. So before getting into that too much, maybe we can step back and say, what is the original threat model that we're looking at? Because confidential computing kind of opens up a new threat model. Um, so if I were to just run a couple of workloads on my laptop, containers are perfect. Uh, great packaging, great UX, good amount of isolation, everything else. But let's say instead of that, I do remote code execution as a service. I'm an infrastructure provider and I'm running someone else's workloads on my machines. At that point, a single layer of isolation makes me a little bit nervous. Um, so what I would do is run them inside each individual configured minimal virtual machine, each container workload. And this is exactly what Kata Containers is doing um, underneath today. So in doing so, I'm protecting my host infrastructure, but also I'm protecting each workload from each other as well. If I were to look at it from a threat model, as a cloud provider standpoint, I trust everything on the host. The boundary of sketch land is getting into the virtual machine where I'm concerned now do not trust anything running in that. Now let's flip that though. If instead I am the workload owner, I inherently have to trust the host. Because if somebody has root access on the host, there's nothing stopping them at that point to be able to just read virtual machine memory or anything else like that. Being inside of a virtual machine may make it a little less convenient for them to see what I'm doing, but it's not gonna stop them at all. If we do want to stop that, this is exactly what confidential computing is looking at doing. Before digging into confidential computing, though, I just want to articulate that Kata containers, the goal is, yes, we're using hardware virtualization. No, we're not running virtual machines. It's an isolation boundary. We're running container workloads. Everything's compatible. We work to minimize overhead, everything else. This is exactly what we want to do with confidential computing as well. 
So I'll pass it to Samuel, who knows a lot more about the subject. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. I suspect you know uh, a lot more than what you pretend, but that's okay. Yeah. What if the user um, didn't need to uh, trust the cloud provider? Actually, what if the user doesn't want or even must not trust the cloud provider? There are a lot of use cases where, as a tenant, you don't want to, or in some cases, you actually are not allowed to trust the cloud provider. And this is what confidential computing is trying to address. Basically, with confidential computing, we're taking the whole host software stack out of the trust boundary. Everything from the firmware, the BIOS, up to the uh, virtualization layer is taken away from the trust boundary and doesn't have to be trusted anymore. As a guest, the only thing you have to trust is yourself and the hardware platform. So with Kata containers, with, we are protecting uh, the infrastructure from uh, the guest uh, through many uh, layers of uh, isolation, including hardware virtualization. With confidential containers, we're piling on top of Kata containers to have the guest no longer have to trust the host itself. Basically, as a tenant, you no longer have to trust com the, the uh, infrastructure owner with confidential containers. So what do we need to do together? What do we need to have the tenant no longer has to trust the, uh, the, uh, the, the host? The first thing you need to do, obviously, is to protect the tenant's data. Um, if you don't want the host to see or tamper with uh, the, the tenant's data, you need to protect it. You need to encrypt the data, the memory, and the CPU state uh, that your tenant is running on top of. Uh, but protecting the data and protecting encrypting memory is not enough. If you don't know where this memory is coming from, who is generating it, and who is actually uh, using it. And to do that, you want to make sure that all your software stack as a tenant is attested and verified. Uh, that is one thing. Uh, you also need to make sure that your platform is, is trustworthy, that your platform is actually implementing confidential computing as expected. And so you also need to attest and verify your hardware platform. Once you have all of this in place, you basically have the, the hardware guarantee that, first of all, uh, your memory, your, your data as a tenant is protected, but, uh, but also that your, your data, the, the, the components that are generating your data and using your data is trusted, is verified. Okay, so with Kata containers, um, uh, we, we are implementing a, a, a certain thread model. With confidential containers, we're basically taking Kata and modifying it to implement the confidential computing uh, uh, promises. To do that, uh, one interesting thing we had to do is to, is to change the uh, container image lifecycle. If you don't want to trust your host, you basically, um, and obviously, you don't want your host to be able to see what's in your container image. So with confidential containers, the image no longer is owned by the host, no longer lives on the host. The, the container image is pulled and decrypted from the guest itself. It stays in the guest encrypted memory. As I said, we also want to verify that the host, the, the tenant software stack is uh, verified, attested and verified. And to do that, we, with confidential containers, we're taking Kata containers and adding remote attestation from the guest. So the Kata containers guests now run remote attestation on top of the confidential computing uh, implementation. We also restricted the way the host interacts with the guest. Uh, there's a lot of uh, API interaction between the host and the guest with Kata containers. With confidential containers, we provided a way to restrict that and make it uh, a lot more secure. And finally, we also abstracted all the uh, specific confidential computing implementations, uh, TDX, uh, SCV, SE, PF, all the Silicon vendors implementation. We abstracted all of this into a common Kata containers implementation. Um, Enough talk. If you want to know more about this, if you want to get more details about this, you can come to our talk tomorrow about confidential containers. But now I'm, I'll let uh, Fabiano run a demo of confidential containers. A pre-recorded one. <laughs> so <laughs> here we have uh, Intel TDX Kubernetes enabled cluster with two runtime classes of Red Setup, Kata and the Kata CC one. Uh, we have, we are starting two Nginx pods. Uh, the first one is a normal one. The second one, as you can see, uh, we have the encrypted image there. Let me just say, the Kata runtime class is the one that is Kata containers as we have it nowadays, while the Kata CC one 
is the one that is actually the confidential containers effort that is going on right now. Uh, once uh, those pods are up, you will be able to see that for the Kata CC one, the image was just pulled inside the guest, while for the Kata containers one, uh, you can see uh, we are just going to show the images on the host side, and the only, only image there is the one used by the Kata runtime. Uh, so now we are going to just like connect to the hypervisor socket and do a dump on a specific memory, uh, a specific address, and show the memory. As you can see here, with the Kata runtime, you can actually have access to the memory. Uh, someone can just tamper with that. While with the confidential containers one, everything is encrypted. Uh, the next part of the demo is just like a really simple example of API restriction. Uh, with the normal containers, with Kata containers, uh, someone, well, an admin can just exec into a pod and ha has, uh, they have access to the, to the pod's content, while with the Kata containers, oh, the computational containers effort is actually restricted along with uh, some other APIs. And the last part of the demo is going to be just a dump uh, on the Kata containers log that is happening inside the guest. So you can see that the attestation was actually happening inside the guest. But for more details about this, join Samuel's talk tomorrow. He will actually explain this in a, in a good face. <laughs> so that's all for the demo. Uh, and we have a few more talks for Kata Containers coming during this uh, OEF Summit. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hey, what's up, man? Finally landed my first fist bump. <laughs> All right, so they just covered a lot around confidential computing with um, Kata containers. But our next speaker, um, throughout the week, we have a lot around Kata, some around confidential computing, others more about just how you can get involved in the community and what they're planning for their next release. But before we get to those sessions, we're next going to hear from the CEO and co-founder of CanaryBit, Nikolay Pallavi. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Open Infra Berlin. So the Kata container guys have introduced and showed confidential computing. It works in, in the Kata containers. But let's take a step back and reflect what it is about. And well, I'll, in my talk, I'll, I'll help you uh, learn more about it, understand what kind of platform support there is, what kind of cloud provider support there is. Let's imagine some new use cases that confidential computing enables, and simply let's learn what's coming next. So the idea behind confidential computing and the main motivation is to raise the trustworthiness of the digital infrastructure we're using. So modern society is tightly coupled with the digital infrastructure, cloud, cloud and uh, networks we use every day. And we need to make sure it's secure. The main innovation here is that as a community, we know very well how to protect data at store or in transit, but so far we are missing the third paradigm, data in process. And this is what confidential computing brings us. It allows us to protect workloads while they're being processed. Moreover, it allows cloud, cloud providers to expose a hardware root of trust to the end users so that the end users are able to verify the environment and obtain security guarantees about the environment where their workloads are running. Finally, and most importantly, they can use these artifacts from the, this attestation reports from the verification to build advanced security policies and build their security in entirely new ways. So let's have a quick look at the evolution of uh, confidential computing. It didn't, it didn't appear just today. It's more than 20 years old. We could say it started with the secure coprocessors launched in, in the, uh, like 20 years ago by IBM. These were hardware coprocessors or cryptographic coprocessors that, were, that could only run a fixed set of uh, cryptographic operations. Later on, ARM released Trust Zone, which allowed to run arbitrary comp computation. And in this talk, I'm actually going to, to, to talk about the latest trend, and that is uh, virtualization-based confidential computing, where the entire virtual machine is considered a trusted execution environment. So let's look at the security properties of virtualization-based trusted execution environments. So we have four major uh, platform providers, uh, that is AMD, Power, Intel, and ARM. And as you can see, 
the only thing that, or the main thing that they ha all have in common is the, this capability for remote attestation. This is exactly what I meant by exposing the root of trust to end users and allowing them to assess or get, obtain information, verifiable information about the security of the, uh, their environments. And we can see here that not all providers um, not all platform providers have the same security features. And that is a good thing, because security never comes for free. It's not a free lunch. Security is always about trade-offs. And by having different approaches from, and different implementations from different providers, we're able to choose the right platform for the right uh, use case, given the right trade-offs. So uh, one thing, though, that here I, I truly believe in is, is open source, and so far not all implementations are open source. Uh, we should all, as a community, encourage the vendors to, to open source their implementations of the trust execution environment firmware, but until then the academic community is doing a great job at finding out vulnerabilities and, and giving feedback to, to the platform vendors. Now let's have a look at the open infra support. Like what, what, what is the open source support for, for running confidential computing? Well, we have pretty good support from um, on the hypervisor level and uh, operating system level in the kernel. There's uh, pending support for AMD SV and Intel TX uh, supposed to soon uh, be uh, soon be merged into the mainline kernel. OpenStack was an early adopter of uh, confidential computing, in particular with AMD ECV. So there was early support already in version 20. And uh, also virtual TPMs, which are technically perhaps not confidential computing, but uh, are an integral part of this ecosystem. Kata containers, you sure heard about uh, this work in the previous keynote. And I'm, sh I'm looking forward to see more support in Kata containers for new technologies. Uh, as, as they come up. And then other projects, there are numerous other projects, uh, open source projects that are developing implementations for open source, uh, for confidential computing. In terms of provider adoption, well, this is not yet there because, first of all, uh, the hardware is not always available. So Intel TDX is not there yet. Um, ARM is not there yet. But we do have plenty of hardware with AMD and Intel SGX. And there's plenty of room to get involved because the, the vendors, they provide us the basic of firmware implementation for trust execution environments. But then there are so many other projects and so many other missing pieces where you as a community can get involved. And we're talking here, of course, about the support in the hypervisor and operating systems, but also new tools need to be developed for monitoring, for migration of confidential VMs, for the lifecycle management of confidential VMs. There's so much more to do. And most importantly, if you need to convince your manager why is this important, this is not just about adding more layers of security. This is about also uh, improving or enabling new use cases. For example, one use case that we are working on, and that is black box software evaluation in confidential uh, computing environments, where instead of just handing over the software for evaluation, it's evaluated uh, in a black box confidential computing environment. Thank you for listening to me, and uh, enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you, Nikolai. So I uh, heard a lot of cool stuff about the container world and how um, you know, as containers have moved to production, as they are getting deployed in more use cases, we have to really think more deeply about how containers should be architected, deployed, operated, managed, how it ties into the devices and everything around it. And uh, I love that a lot of that work is happening within open source and within you know, these communities. Um, we did an Open Infra Live episode pretty recently that covered confidential computing with uh, some of the, the Kata Containers folks in AMD. Um, if you are interested in understanding more about this topic, I would encourage you to go check that out. It's, uh, it's a very, very cool area of innovation that is really important as we want you know, to take containers to more and more use cases in more and more places. So uh, next up, we have another speaker from Canonical. Help me welcome Titus Kurek. All right. Good morning, everyone. Super excited to be here this week together with you. 
For those of you who don't know me, my name is Titus Kurek. I'm a product manager at Canonical, and I've been involved in the open infra community since the OpenStack Apps House release, which was like eight years ago. What an amazing journey. I remember that very well. It was 2014. I was willing to learn OpenStack as everyone around me at that time. And I decided to follow a manual installation procedure on Ubuntu, and it took me guess how long. It took me two months to get it up and running. So I was like, wow, this stuff is really complex, huh? And then two years later, I joined Canonical. I joined as a field engineer. And one of my first tasks was to deploy OpenStack using OpenStack Charms. So I sit down with my lap, and I got it, drum, I got it up and running in just a few days. And I was like, wow, this stuff is not as complex as I initially thought. huh? So we can tame it, right? We can tame the complexity behind OpenStack by using proper tooling. But today, I'm going to talk about something different, market data points. There is a methodology used by Gartner and other types of analyst institutions that helps to visualize how every technology evolves over time. I'm pretty sure you've seen it before. It's called the hype cycle. It consists of two axes, time and visibility. And it's broken down into five primary stages. The technology trigger, peak of inflated expectations, through of disillusionment, slope of enlightenment, and plateau of productivity. OpenStack was founded in 2010. It was founded to address a need for an open source own infrastructure implementation. And it got a lot of visibility inside of the open open source community. And then it moved to the peak of inflated expectations somewhere around the ice house release. There was a lot of excitement. There were a lot of hopes. There were a lot of dreams. But not many of them got real. And then it started being less and less visible. A lot of new technologies came in, including containers, serverless. And we were all having a lot of doubts whether it's ever going to arise again. Today, I have no doubts that OpenStack has just passed this difficult period. I have no doubts that OpenStack has just entered the slope of enlightenment. And I have no doubts that it will continue to grow in the following years until it reaches this plateau of productivity, which is a stage where you know nothing exciting will ever happen again. <laughs> there are multiple reasons that let me think that way. So first of all, when Kubernetes and container technologies originally came in, they were seen as a kind of competitive technologies to OpenStack. And people became uncertain whether they should perform their digital migration based on OpenStack or Kubernetes. Today, we know that Kubernetes and container technologies are more like complementary technologies to OpenStack. And this trend falls very well under this new acronym, LOCKI, which stands for Linux, OpenStack, Kubernetes, and infrastructure. And this new acronym fits very well within Canonical's mission for the entire spectrum of open source, with Loki being used for infrastructure implementation and charmed operators with long-term support OCI images being used for streamlined delivery and operations of applications on the top of the Loki stack. So OpenStack was originally founded as an open source implementation of AWS EC2 service. And it's still being used that way. So just a few months back, Pacific Textiles, one of the world's largest fabric mills, built a private cloud infrastructure using an Ubuntu-based Loki stack for the purpose of running both traditional and cloud-native workloads on a single platform. And then it was picked up by telcos. And they adjusted it to their demanding needs, including enhanced platform awareness, various performance extensions, et cetera. And it's still being used that way. So just to give you another example, Telefonica Brazil, the biggest mobile operator in Brazil, has recently completed a migration of their online charging system to Canonical OpenStack and set a foundation for a 5G rollout. But OpenStack is more than that. So recently, at Canonical, 
we've been seeing an increasing interest in OpenStack as a platform for local public cloud infrastructure implementation. If you think about that, in some parts of the world, an access to the hyperscaler infrastructure is challenging. This is either due to local government regulations, low bandwidth, high latency. In these countries, in these parts of the world, a local OpenStack-based public cloud infrastructure is a reasonable alternative. And finally, OpenStack has recently started being seen as a foundation for high-performance computing. This is very much relevant to another user of OpenStack on Ubuntu, Firmus, who, by the way, designed one of the most efficient data centers in the world. What connects all of those customers are superior economic advantages available in canonical OpenStack. One of the biggest promises behind an own infrastructure implementation has always been TCO reduction compared to hyperscalers. Our mission is to fulfill that promise. Our mission is to bring down the TCO of cloud infrastructure maintenance, leaving much more space for increased innovation, helping our users to grow, innovate, and at the end of the day, be more competitive on the market. And finally, performance. As a publisher and maintainer of Ubuntu, for years we've been cooperating with leading silicon manufacturers around to make sure that our operating system is optimized for a variety of CPUs available out there. Moreover, starting from OpenStack Champs 2204 release, the NVIDIA vGPU technology is now natively available in Canonical OpenStack. And last but not least, OpenStack Yoga now comes with a native integration with NVIDIA DPUs, or SmartNICs, enabling OVN offloading. So all of that looks super exciting. It looks super exciting and lets me think about the next steps, next milestones we could set for ourselves as an open infra community. What would those be? We'll figure that out very soon. We have a lot of time. Remember, the slope of enlightenment is just ahead of us. Find us at booth B11. All right, so we've heard a lot about Loki, which Titus just talked about, and so he is going to bring another presentation this week to talk about how Linux, OpenStack, and Kubernetes integrate together um, across the world um, with many organizations, including ones in this room. So we've talked a little bit about confidential computing this morning. We have a few other topics. Um, the next one that is really pervasive here in Europe specifically is around digital sovereignty. Um, so a lot of security concerns, um, so similar to confidential computing. And we have a few government officials here this morning um, that are kind of going to be interviewed by Frederick Lardois of TechCrunch to understand how, this role, how digital sovereignty is um, being affected by open source and what can be done by the people in this room to make sure that they have the security that they need. So first, I'd like to introduce Frederick Lardinois from TechCrunch, as well as Dr. Franziska Brotner from the Federal Ministry of Climate Action and Economic Affairs. All right, it's so weird being in front of a group of people again after all these years. So. <laughs> True. Yes, isn't it? Um, Francisca, so when I talk to a lot of companies and they talk about digital sovereignty, it often feels like it's code for Germany. So I'm really, <laughs> really glad that you're here. And I think you've got a couple of prepared remarks to get this started and then I'll um, get some time for a little Q&A. So take it away. Yeah, thank you. And a warm welcome to Berlin. It's uh, wonderful having so many people in Berlin. Uh, we were just debating what is usually the problem, people or tech? Uh, who thinks it's people? Who thinks it's tech? What is easier? Um, so <laughs> I think the answer well, was the implied. The answer is uh, implied <laughs> in this room. Um, no, but seriously, it's great to see people again. Uh, and having you in Berlin is an honor to have you in the city. Uh, and as you said, you know, digital s tech technology and uh, digital sovereignty for us, we have it anchored in our coalition treaty, and we define it as the capacity to be able to act and to reduce vulnerabilities. So it's twofold. The one is really reduce your weaknesses, your where others can attack you, 
and the other side is to be able to innovate, to develop your, by yourself, to set your own standards, to define the values you want to see in technology. Um, so these two objectives are behind what we mean when we talk about digital sovereignty. And we in our ministry, it's the Ministry of Economy and Climate Protection, we have legislative tools, we do a lot on Data Act, AI regulation, Data Institute, you know, so a lot of regulate, regulatory work, but we also have funding, Gaia X, Catena X, um, you know, and then we're gonna launch something new this month, it's the Sovereign Tech Fund, uh, which I'm very proud of that we finally get it off the road. We have two and a half million this year, and the idea of the Sovereign Tech Fund is to say we have people who are sort of, you know, monitoring and scouting where uh, there might be security risks in open source, um, and then match it with companies, developers that can work on it, and the state will fund those companies, developers to take care of it. So it's a matchmaking process, it's a, you know, it's first a monitoring process, uh, and we will kick it off this month, um, and hopefully it will be running very soon. We're very uh, much working on it to make it a very fast process. That's unusual for... <laughs> <laughs> fast process is not what we think about when we think about... Germany, politics, okay. Right? Yeah. Not Ger I wasn't going <laughs> to say Germany, but, but you said that, that wasn't me. <laughs> But it's true, we're trying to speed up a lot of processes, but uh, yeah, it's real work. For sure, for yeah. sure. Um, this fund is specifically for open source software, right? Only. Only. And we talk, we actually, we talk a lot about supply chain mm. security these days, right? Is two million enough? Oh, we start this year. Okay. This is the start. <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> it will certainly increase and we are funding for the next year's budget as well. Um, no, but this is to kick it off, we, you know, we need to set it up and get the right people to work on it. So if we spend the money by the end of the year, it will be fine and then we go on and roll it out, yeah. Sure. But yeah, raw material like critical supply chains, this is yet another issue we're working on. It's even, that's much more complicated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for sure it is. Um, now you've worked on digital sovereignty for quite a while, right? Um, what advice would you give other there's probably not too many government representatives here, unless you are, raise your hand, but other companies, other organizations in terms of how to apply some of those principles that you've found for the work that you're doing to their work. You know, right now I'm in this position since December, so I'm learning from other governments. Uh, it's rather this way around. <laughs> I hope that by the end of this legislative term, we can inspire some others. Um, but right now we are looking what other governments are doing. We're also really looking that we do it in a cooperative way, like a European way. I don't want it to be German. Mm -hmm. So we have this working group with the French government, with the Commission on Digital Sovereignty. So we do it really in sync with other member states of the EU, also in exchange with our American partners. Um, but, you know, and also from you, because there are not so many government leaders in here. I want to learn. So if you have good proposals and say, you know, this is what a German, a French, a European government should do, uh, please let us know. I still have a couple of months to implement, so, <laughs> you know, any ideas are welcome. <laughs> um, what, what is it that um, maybe this group of people can do for you? I except for vote for you, that's something else. <laughs> but, but, but what can they do for you? What do you need from the open source community? You know, I think really coming up with uh, your proposals of what would help you in doing your business. Um, and I think we have to prove the security of it because that's such an issue that is at the heart of so many. I think also showing how it can be greener, how we can link the digital and the sustainability agenda. Uh, I think there's a huge opportunity for the open community to make this um, you know, a competitive edge, as you say. Um, and also work on supply chains, look where do you, you know. So I think there are a few things uh, we can work on together. And by the way, I think government has a much stronger role in procurement as well. I mean, Germany has this sort of open source part in its governmental policy for years, uh, but I hope that we can strengthen it. So just be sort of a user, a buyer as a government um, is also something where I think we can play an even larger role. But mainly, you know, seriously, uh, I hope you will take up the new uh, directions and help us Europeans to stay safe uh, and innovative. 
Awesome. Well, I know you've got an other meeting that's just as important as this one to go to. So um, thank you very much for being <laughs> here. too many, the tyranny of the day, the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a long day for you, I think. So really appreciate you being here. And um, maybe we can see you again next time. Yeah, and have a wonderful stay in Berlin, productive sessions, and looking forward to hearing from you. Thank All you. Right. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, Francesca. Perfect. So have fun. British Tax Authority, who should be back there somewhere. Thank you. Um, and we're going to talk about doing our taxes, so that'll be fun. Um, yes, <laughs> pay, pay your taxes and you're fine. Pay your taxes <laughs> and you're fine. <laughs> Especially in Sweden, because he, he only cares yeah, about we, that. Yeah, we like taxes. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Caught you off guard there. Yes, you did. <laughs> Sorry. Do you like taxes? Of course. Okay, good. Um, let's talk about something else, though. Uh, there used to be a time where we could do tech conferences and not talk about politics, but I think yep. those days are over. And I think especially with the war in Ukraine, a lot of things have changed, yeah. for Sweden especially, right, yeah. with the whole NATO discussion now. How has your thinking about digital sovereignty changed since then, since the war began, maybe even before? Yeah, there's been a big, quite a big change happening sort of over the last couple of years, but Ukraine has, so if we had a ramp up for a couple of years, we saw sort of the, the, the level of sort of security that we have as a country and the defense and so forth, we have ramped up, but with Ukraine, it's sort of skyrocketed. And so that makes, of course, a really, really big change for everything in society, but especially for the government and the government agencies and how we look at security, how we look at how we build ICT services, because everything is ICT in one way or another. So we have to, and that's, it, it's hard to sort of step up enough in, in this moment. Maybe we have the resources, but we don't have the people or, or the time to be able to have that level that we should have. Sure. What would enough look like? Oh, that's a good question. I think we, we need to have some kind of resiliency model where we, where we have to look at both what the market can do and, and what, what different sort of private companies can, can sell to the government and sell to the society, where you have most of the innovation but we also need to have some things within the government and we need to have better data centers and more resilient IT for the things that is really, really important for society. And again, if we get into a war, what kind of information stays? Which, which information do we have after the war? And, and those kinds of discussions, and that is sort of a little bit beyond what the private sector is usually providing. Sure, which brings up the question, what can open source do? for you in this? this yeah, so, so first off, I, I, I just see that open source is everywhere and it, it's not a discussion anymore. I've been doing open source since the 90s and then it was like open source, what's that? Uh, and you had all these cancer debates and all kinds of things, but today it's just there everywhere. Every new innovation that is software based is open source one way or another. Yeah. So we get that. But the good thing that bears with it in, in, in infrastructure projects like, like OpenStack or Kubernetes is that we can have the same kind of software stack within our own data centers or governmental data centers or in the private data centers or private companies. So we can buy what fits us best or we can move workloads and we can also share the innovation. So we don't have to have like a governmental sort of a less good version and, and, and the private companies or the cloud companies are having the, the shiny good one. Uh, we can much more share and be developing together, and I think that's a, a really good thing. Hmm. Do you think uh, you're able to achieve that, uh, your own private cloud that is as good as the, the government cloud that you can buy from a vendor? <laughs> it depends on, depends on how you define good. Um, <laughs> Of course. Doesn't it always? Yeah, of course. So it always comes down to definitions. But, but the thing is that if you want to have, if you look at it from a perspective of a country, so what defines a country? We have sort of a register for who owns what pieces of land. You have a register for who is an, a member of society who is like a Swedish citizen. There's a register for that, that, that the tax agency has. But if those are gone, things, <laughs> things are not very, very good. Sure. So we need to keep, keep them and to to make that good, we need to have them in, in s some way, but we also need the private companies and we need the innovation. And coming back to that, instead of what would be good is that working together. I think that's always the case, and then we see it more and more that customers or, or even sort of public sector 
bodies uh, and private sector companies are working more and more together to try to solve solutions in, in tandem instead of not just being a buyer and a seller. We're doing much more together. And I think as we heard sort of the, the speakers in the beginning as well, that's collaboration is the future and that goes along not only between companies, also between sort of customer and, and, and cloud providers or technology providers. Sure. How religious are you about a solution having to be open source? Not at all. Okay. You know, and then I, don't, I don't see we have to. As again, mm -hmm. I said, new stuff is open source. So it, it comes for free. Right. So I don't, so I, I used to be quite religious about it, but, but I don't have to anymore. So it's open source as one in, 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 in a lot of sense. So you don't have to. But again, if you're looking into infrastructure projects, I mean, everything is open source. You get it sure. anyway. You can't get anything else. Right. Yep. Yep, for sure. Well, that's a positive way to end. So thank you very much, Daniel. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. So um, we talked a little bit about digital sovereignty from the government perspective this morning. So like Mark said earlier with a map, which he, we have in every keynote for him, we have 180 plus OpenStack powered public cloud data centers distributed throughout the world. So digital sovereignty is also something that these organizations are facing and that they are having to find ways to adhere to different local, regional, and even some global regulations. So for our next keynote, we're gonna invite the VP of Open Telecom Cloud, Andreas Faulkner. Hello and servus at the Open Info Summit. It's great to see you again to exchange views and ideas and talking about OpenStack's future. But not only to talk, but to work on the future. In these days, you're again paving the way to the, to the, to the future of the world's leading open cloud uh, initiative. My name is Andreas Falkner, and I would like to welcome you in Germany's capital, Berlin, as a representative of a local player, the Open Telecom Cloud. Looking around and picking up the mood, this is what I missed. It's the personal contact. This vibrant atmosphere feels like being in an anthill. This is an interesting metaphor, I think. The perfect example for a strong, lively, and successful community. And what impressive things a community can achieve. And speaking from my personal experience, meeting the community in person makes creativity flow again. Your inventiveness is what counts. It's a means to achieve our common goal, building an easy to use and competitive open source based cloud platform as an alternative solution to the proprietary ecosystem of the hyperscalers. It is you who are building the foundation for that. It is you to deliver the innovation we need to be up to date with user demands. And it's you that empower us as an open source based cloud providers to offer our customers a vendor independent and compliant cloud experience that cover their business needs. And with clients accepting our open source based cloud solutions, we stay relevant for the market. And don't forget, we are doing this not only for us but to provide the users a powerful alternative. The open infra, infra ecosystem is our clients as well. And from my point of view, OpenStack is doing quite good. You enable us to continuously grow with Open Telecom Cloud, whilst we are connecting your technological achievements with our operations expertise. 
Meanwhile, we're one of the biggest European-based cloud providers. And your success, this is your success. Our success is your success. We are operating more than half a million vCPUs, four petabytes of RAM, and 600 petabytes of storage, in the meanwhile, eight availability zones in Europe for more than 100 million end users. And one example of, for that is the Corona Warn app we are running for the German government. Our latest child is a community cloud for business in Switzerland. We built this up completely from scratch within six months in a Swiss data center, based on everything we learned about OpenStack in the previous years, adding our own operations experience. That way, we can provide higher security standards to the Swiss market using the same deployment and operations principles than in the public cloud. Our biggest Swiss customer is moving his workloads into this community cloud. He was previously a customer of our Open Telecom private solution in Switzerland. And he's doing this based on the same APIs, the same technology stack, the same operations and maintenance procedures than we are, than we are experienced in the public cloud. So with this latest enhancement to our Open Telecom Cloud offering, we are able to react fast to local requirements and roll out these community cloud solutions in Europe fast and flexible. So thanks for having us part of this team. We are eager to talk to you. Our engineers, architects, and experts gladly share their experience on OpenStack with you. We have talks about machine learning, delivery pipelines, and security plugins for Ansible and Terraform. Join our discussion, uh, our panel discussion on Sovereign Cloud, or just get in touch with us. You can meet us at booth B1 at the ground floor or at the open lounge just next to it. And now, don't forget to enjoy the summit. Thank you. Awesome, and if you want to meet more of the Open Telecom team, they do have a lounge on level B by the Northwest Staircase, so hang out there. There's some charging outlets as well as some seating for you to just hang out and network with the rest of the people in this room. So the next part is actually my favorite part of the keynotes. Um, it's the Super User Awards. We have a lot of great nominees over here, some of them matching. Um, so to help me introduce all the nominees as well as to announce the winner, Please join me in welcoming the marketing coordinator from the Open Infra Foundation who runs Superuser, Sunny Sai. Hi, everyone. For people who might not be familiar with Superuser Awards, the awards are launched in the Paris Summit back in 2014. Since then, the Open Infra Foundation has hosted the annual Superuser Awards to recognize organizations that have used open infrastructure to improve their business while contributing back to the community. Let's introduce the 11 nominees that we have for the Berlin Summit this year. Our first nominee is N Group. As one of the Open Infra Foundation's platinum member, N Group announced that it achieved carbon neutrality in 2021 by reducing almost 30,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions with green computing technologies, including color containers. Our next nominee is Arvid Cloud, with five public cloud data centers and more than 10,000 VMs and 10 billion daily requests. They've cut their operation costs by over 20% using OpenStack as their public and their private cloud platform. And next up, we have Canary Bit. Canary Bit's business is built on open infrastructure from the very beginning. And this is reflected throughout its organizational culture Reliance on open infrastructure allows its team to easily scale in data centers running OpenStack throughout the world. 
Our next nominee is actually our first individual, which is really exciting. So this nominee is Daniel Bystrom. He's been instrumental in arranging both OpenStack and open infrastructure meetups in Sweden. So these are great for the local community there to get there and learn about OpenStack and other open infrastructure technologies. Next, we have Fairbanks. Fairbanks have several open infrastructure de uh, deployments in support, ranging from small OpenStack environments to large OpenStack deployments running 400 plus hypervisors and an open, OpenStack deployment with over 500,000 virtual CPUs. Our next nominee is Inspur. So they have provided an AI ops system based on OpenStack, and they also just contributed the Venus project to the OpenStack community just last year. The next nominee is IT team at Jiangsu Suzhong Construction Group company. Partnering with Huayun Cloud, Suzhong Construction Group actively participates in the open infra community activities and shares its experience in OpenStack in China. The next nominee is Open Metal. They, op they operate 30 to 35 individual OpenStack private clouds in their Virginia data center. And in the next year, they're also going to be expanding their footprint into Europe and to other regions in the United States. Next, we have OVH Cloud. OVH Cloud is currently running over 400,000 instances with 900,000 cores of OpenStack and processing over 6 million API requests every hour. And our next one is Volvo Cars. So when it comes to the code in the car, Zool is their default CI system at the Volvo Cars Corporation. With Zool's built-in dependency system, its team went from a week of integration to just three and a half hours. I love the Photoshop of Jim Blair here from Acme Gating, who is their partner, by the way. Right in the Volvo car. In the driver's seat, nonetheless. I love it, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last but not least, we have the IT team at Zhejiang Express Company. Using open source technology such as OpenStack, Ceph, and KVM, its entire environment involves nearly 2,000 servers and around 500 edge cloud computing subsites. Awesome. All right, I guess this is the moment. This is it. <laughs> so I'll let Sunny take the honors. Thank you. All right, I'd like to ask everyone to give a big round of applause to our winner for the Super User Awards this year, which is N Group and OVN. <laughs> So Ant Group was not able to be here with us today because of some of the travel restrictions, but we do have the massive team from OVH Cloud, who is very close to being in the One Million Cores Club, may I say, when I was reading through that, which is very exciting. And right. Jonathan has your trophy. Yes, here we go. So, may need a minute here. And Ant Group, uh, your trophy is on the way. Um, congratulations to you as well. We'll, uh, we'll celebrate when, uh, when we can all be together again. But yes, let's get the OVH team up here. And uh, a lot of blue shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? And, uh, <laughs> OK, all right. So let, let's get a photo real quick oh, to uh, I don't who, even know where got to go. the trophy. We need, all right, yeah. Uh, hello. <laughs> all right, and uh, <laughs> Helena here is a uh, wave. Yeah. Oh, squeeze. All right, got to get in a little. Yeah. <laughs> Where's our own? Thank you. All right. Thank awesome. You. So, so congratulations, OVH. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and again, also congratulations to Ant Group, um, two incredibly involved organizations across many, many open source projects, well-deserved winners there. So that ends our program for today. Um, please remember to wear your masks and, uh, you know, respect and protect all of our fellow attendees as we go through the rest of the day. Um, and back here tomorrow morning, same time, we'll get started again. 
So have a good time with Open Infra. There's no. Oh.